This is going to be about half an hour on uh, how to become a court interpreter, both a credentialed one um, and sort of uh, the preamble. Before you get your credential, there are certain kinds of legal interpreting that you can still do. And then um, sort of the career path after that. If you want to do this as a part-time job or a full-time job or as part of another job, like some people are a paralegal and an interpreter sort of on the side as an additional duty, those are all uh, good options and the way you proceed will kind of depend on your language pair how uh, in demand it is for the area where you live but since COVID, everybody's been interpreting by zoom anyways all over the country and so that's helped interpreters of less common languages find work uh, all over with populations that are more spread out all right so thank you to those of you who are introducing yourself um, i will go back and read all those chats but what if i'm busy talking i may not have time to to respond to it immediately uh here's my powerpoint give me a thumbs up if you can see it should be a blue screen with a title did i do it right okay thank you never sure so this is called uh tentatively the zoom q a session for aspiring court interpreters um, whether you are currently an interpreter or not it'll cover the process in texas and many other states that have a similar uh system i'm gonna go through and mute People who aren't unmuted for now, just because it gets kind of noisy, don't be offended. <clears throat> so court interpreting, some people call it translating, legal translating, um, but court interpreting is the specific term when a bilingual person helps convert between two spoken languages or sign language, though that's kind of a different uh, tribe, um, but it's so that people can communicate without knowing each other's languages in a nutshell. A court interpreter works in court and in uh, law firms and in other uh, legal settings. Let me just uh, let everybody in. Admit all. We've got a couple more people here. Great. Um, the demand for court interpreters is currently high. And in Texas, at least, you can often make $1,000 a day as a freelance court interpreter, depending on your credential and where you're working and what your language is. I've heard of um, less common languages like Mandarin charging twice as much as that when they're interpreting for uh, civil suits, um, like if one company is suing another and they have a big budget, they'll pay the asking rate of the interpreter. And the good news is that artificial intelligence is still not very good at human language. It can, it can pretend to speak human languages, but it doesn't get a lot of the subtleties that humans perceive from the entire uh, context, like nuance, allusion, irony, humor, cultural references, historic references, literary references. Uh, we pick up on those in ways that uh, something like Google Translate just can't understand. And then the term translation, which is sometimes used interchangeably, it actually just refers to written language. So I'm talking about spoken languages tonight, but there's also a, a big market for written languages, and those do work nicely hand in hand if you want to do both. So here's the good news. AI still can't understand this. On the left, I've got a handwritten note, and I'll give you a minute to read both of these. And I bet every human being on this call um, can understand what it's talking about, even though there's typos and emojis and bad handwriting. While a computer cannot understand either of these images here. And these are just examples of sort of a irregular human communication. On the left, we have somebody who can't quite remember the Pledge of Allegiance, and so he's just sort of said it in his own words and just made up the spelling, like maybe kindergarten level spelling. And on the right, we have somebody who's alluding to a song. I think it was the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song in like the 80s. And so people who watched that TV show 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, however, when I was a kid, um, well, remember, oh, this is a, a funny version of a theme song that was popular in a cultural context, while a computer just wouldn't have any idea what to make of that. And so when it comes to this kind of language or its spoken equivalent, humans are just really good at it. Um, we have a feel for it. So I'm going to jump right into the, the inappropriate part. My mother told me never to talk about money in public, that it's impolite to say how much you earn. But because this is a an employment uh, presentation and you're wondering can I make a living doing this I, I surveyed all the court interpreters in Texas last year after COVID and asked them how much they were making if they were working for a private client like a law firm and the average was uh, in the 80 to 100 dollar range um, per hour and that's almost always a two hour minimum so if you go and show up and they just need you for 10 minutes or you go and show up and they don't need you at all 
they still pay you the two hour minimum, $200 just for being there. Uh, some beginners, at least in here in Central Texas, I know will start for $75 when they first get their, their credential, $75 an hour to kind of get a foot in the door. And then soon they go up to 100. And some people who have been doing it for 20 years will raise their rates to 120, 150 for Spanish. And for other languages that are harder to come by, they can command maybe 25%, 50% more than the Spanish interpreters because there's hundreds of Spanish interpreters. Uh, we have a we have more competition, <laughs> but there's also a lot more Spanish speakers who need our services. So it's also a, a good deal. Um, I also asked in the same survey, if you're a freelancer, how busy do you stay with interpreting? In other words, how how much demand is there? And most people said, I stay busy interpreting and turn down assignments frequently. And I'm in that category. I'm always getting requests for assignments I just can't do. And I'll refer it out to a colleague or I'll say, no, sorry, I'm already booked then. And then the second group here, the red group said, I have enough assignments to fit my lifestyle. Maybe I'm a stay at home mom. Um, I can only do it when my kids are at school. So I don't want to work full time, but I have a, a job or two a week that I'm able to go out and interpret. And it's a nice uh, side hustle. So these are the steps if you are interested in uh, earning your state interpreter's license. In Texas, it's called a license. In a lot of places, it's called a uh, certification, same idea. Um, there's four sort of phases everybody has to go through. The first one is you have to learn your second language well. Most of us have a, a native language that we speak very well, very fluently. And then a second language that we're pretty good at, maybe one is like our grandparents' language that we learned as children, and the other one is the language of where we went to school or maybe the language we were educated in versus the language of where we live now. Um, but everybody has a weaker language and you probably have to uh, strengthen it and make sure that you got a good strong vocabulary and you can uh, speak it fluently, not just about everyday things, but talking about things in the future and things in the past and hypothetical things and using it at a, at a high level. In my case, Spanish is my second language. So I studied Spanish in college um, and then uh, worked in jobs that required me to use Spanish on a daily basis until I got up to the level where my Spanish was strong. It's still, you can, if I spoke Spanish to you right now, you can still tell it's not my native language, but I'm able to do everything I need to do in the language. Uh, the second step is learning to interpret. And again, interpreting is just spoken translation. So it means that you should, you shouldn't jump right into court interpreting as your first foray into the field. That's uh, that's kind of a challenging um, sector. Most of us start interpreting in the schools, like for parent teacher meetings, or maybe at church, we'll interpret for the people who don't speak the language of the, the speaker, or um, in social service settings, helping refugees and uh, asylum seekers, that kind of thing. And we just get comfortable with it and about thinking quickly and coming up with the word on the fly and uh, trying to figure out our way past these puzzles where, where there's no obvious interpretation, being creative and um, getting uh, our, just our own confidence in our ability to interpret. Then once you know how to interpret between your two languages or sometimes more than two, um, you have to take some tests. There's a written test and an oral test. And if you pass both of them in Texas, you get the credential. Um, if you're in some of the other states, uh, you may pass the written test and get a basic credential that lets you do certain kinds of uh, courts, like lower level. And then when you pass the oral test, you get the higher one that lets you do all kinds of courts. But I'll focus on the Texas example here because I think most of the audience tonight is looking at um, the Texas program. And if you're not, put that in the chat and I can give you directions for other states as well. About 43 of the states in the country now have very similar uh, systems and they share the same exam. So it's it's not interchangeable, but it's parallel. After you pass the test and you get your credential, then you are a freelancer. Most people, there are some full-time jobs you may be hired um, to do, to work for a court or to work for a law firm, and then you just interpret as an additional duty. But most of us, I'd say 90% of the profession, we do it as freelancers. And that means sort of like you're a freelance electrician or freelance uh, realtor, um, you have to go out and find the work. And so we become entrepreneurs, we network, we market ourselves, we create an online presence and a resume, and we send out emails to people who might need an interpreter, and we, we join associations and we get referrals. And it's, uh, it's sort of a process that they gradually snowballs. Your first year, you spend a lot of time looking for the assignments, and your second year, more time actually working in your third year, you, you hopefully will have your schedule packed 
and you'll start turning down assignments because you've got more work than you need. But it's not something that will pay all your bills right off the bat. It's something that you have to kind of ease into and, and often with another source of income during the transition process. So it makes a good part-time job at first. Uh, so now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit closer to those steps. Uh, first, you have to learn a second language. I assume everyone on this call is, is bilingual to some degree. Um, or probably you wouldn't be here. Why is my phone still making noise? You know, after having a phone all these years, you think I could turn off the sound, but no. Um, so you don't have to be a native speaker of either language. Um, I hardly spoke any Spanish until I was in college. I grew up in a, in a very uh, Spanish speaking neighborhood on the border. And so I heard it a lot, but I wasn't forced to use it. And so it's just more of a passive understanding. Uh, you don't have to speak without an accent. Most of us have an accent in one of our languages. You don't have to know every word. Every, every language has, English has over a million words now. Um, but if you know about 3,000 words, you can be considered fluent because those 3,000 words cover 90 some percent of the everyday spoken English. And so um, there can be lots of words that you learn on the job that you don't learn when you first go in. Like when I, I was a medical interpreter a long time ago, and so I studied a list, a couple of pages of medical terminology, and I knew the basics enough to pass my medical test. And then when I got to the assignment, it turned out to be a different kind of medicine. You know, I had studied like all of these uh, general general health terms, and then it was a um, an, uh, you know a dental appointment, and I didn't know the dental terms. And so every time you get sent out to a new job, you learn a new set of words, and that's that's normal. That's how you build your vocabulary step by step. But you do have to be able to speak accurately on a variety of topics at a formal level, an informal level, and sometimes even a vulgar level. If you're, if somebody is repeating testimony about an argument they got into, there might be profanity in there and you have to be able to figure out how to say profanity in the other language that's about as offensive, not more, not less offensive. And that's, that's a value judgment there. And here I have some diagrams of the the way our brain changes when we learn a second language. By the way, good news, if you're bilingual, you'll probably live longer and you will get senile dementia later because you use your brain in more ways than monolingual people do. So it's sort of an insurance policy too, to enjoy your life. Um, so after you're bilingual, next you work on your translation and interpretation. A lot of this is individual practice, uh, volunteering for charitable organizations that need an interpreter. We can all find those in different settings. And most of them will be very grateful for your help. Um, you can work as an interpreter as an additional duty. I was a bilingual teacher for a while in the public schools and I had all the Spanish speaking kids. And so when their parents would come in and talk to the counselor or the librarian or the, the principal or somebody, I would be called in to interpret for the parents. And that was good practice for me and helpful for them. Um, and that would be a non-legal setting, more of what we call community interpreting. And as you practice, you're building your speed your vocabulary, your slang, your dialects, your accents. I was very used to the Mexican accent. And then I did telephonic interpreting where people from uh, would call New York 911. Most of them were Dominicans from the certain neighborhood. And so I had to get used to the Dominican accent and some of the Dominican expressions that I wasn't used to. And then the Cubans would call when we got the contract for Miami and I had to um, wrap my head around a whole new accent and a different way of saying the words. And, and it was, uh, it was very useful for me to have that uh, telephonic job back in the early 2000s um, because of all of the accents from all over the Spanish speaking world. I imagine for other languages um, that are represented here, you also have regional accents, some of which are challenging. Um, you increase your active listening, concentration and memory. Interpreters have to be able to focus like a laser beam. And um, for some people that just takes a uh, a sustained practice. If they're used to tuning out people who are speaking, you can't tune them out anymore because you need to hear every word. Um, and you have to be able to hear what somebody is saying for a while and then interpret in your head and then repeat it without dropping out the details. And so it's like exercising a muscle. It's like saying, I'm going to run a, a 10K in a year and here's my training plan so that I can build the muscles and build my lung capacity. Your brain is a muscle and your, your vocal apparatuses are muscles. And you have to exercise them and make them stronger. And then finally, you have to get comfortable translating puzzles, coming up with how to say something in another language. And I put some examples here. For those of you who speak Spanish, um, think about, and you don't have to say this, but whatever your language is, think about how you'd say in your other language, put the pedal to the metal. 
There, there are expressions that mean that same idea in other languages. Maybe you don't have one in your language, and maybe you can just say, well, I know, put the pedal to the metal is what somebody says when they want you to go faster, like to get to work. And so you can just think, how would I say get to work or hurry up in my language? And that'll probably be good enough to pass the test and good enough on the job too. Um, if somebody says, admit that she bore you a child. I heard this in a maternity, in a paternity case one time. This guy had a girl on the side, he was married. His girlfriend had his baby. He was being sued over it or divorced or something. And the, the lawyer said, admit that she bore you a child. And I had to say in Spanish that she bore you a, and when I got to child, it's like, well, child is gender specific. The normal words in Spanish are gender specific. There are gender neutral ways to express that. Maybe I should say, admit that she bore you a son or a daughter, but I was a beginner. And so I said, admit that she bore you a son and she'd actually born him a daughter. And so the guy's like, no. And so then we have this misunderstanding where he is technically answering the Spanish question, honestly, but I am losing something in my interpretation, which could cause a misunderstanding. It could, you know, change the course of, a, of an outcome of a trial. And so as an interpreter, we have to be real alert to that kind of a stumbling block going back and forth between the languages, make sure that there's no wiggle room in our word choice. And then for those of you who speak Spanish, um, here are some expressions that are kind of uh, culturally bound in Spanish that mm, might be hard to express in English. And if anybody wants to give it a shot for the non-Spanish speakers, um, if you could put in the chat uh, how you might say, fui al bar con mi comadre. It means I went to the bar with my, and then this comadre is kind of hard to say in English. Like there's no one word that means the same thing. Anybody want to give it a shot? Technically, it means my co-mother, but we don't have co-mothers in English. <laughs> so I'll give you, a, I'll let you work on that. Uh, another couple that are linked or culturally. Yeah. My child's godmother, right? Excuse me? My child's godmother. It is my child's godmother, yes. Um, but people who don't have children and don't have godmothers still have comadres. Right. Right, right, that's a good one. Yeah. So there's a broader yeah. application in the culture. Right, 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 right. Yeah, sure. That's it. That's Any other problem. ideas? <laughs> oh, okay. Think about it. I, I use bestie. I said I went to the bar with my bestie because it's sort of like your female best friend for a woman. Yeah. yeah. There, Blanca said the same thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's a good workaround. Or you could say with my with my girlfriend, with my best friend, with my close friend. Uh, me puso el ojo refers to a traditional superstition of somebody cursing you by looking at you with um, envy. And there's really no equivalent in English, but it's very familiar to most Spanish speakers. If somebody accuses you of putting the eye on them, it's, um, there is the concept of the evil eye in some Western European countries. And so you could say, um, he hexed me, he jinxed me, he gave me the evil eye, but it's not the stink eye. In English, we have the stink eye. And that just means when somebody looks at you angrily, and it's a little bit stronger than that. Um, and then the last one, we just have a, a profanity that is, is a sort of um, typically Mexican profanity. And the, the challenge is deciding how offensive is it and which, which swear word do I want to use in English? And we won't get into that. Those are just uh, examples of puzzles that we as interpreters love to solve, but sometimes they, they stop us in our tracks and we're like, wait, 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 how do you say that? Because we've never had to say it in the other language. Okay, so once you're able to interpret and you feel ready to enter the legal sector, uh, you want to start studying for the test, the, oral, the written test first and then the oral test. Um, to take the written test, you're going to want to learn about the legal system how to kind of uh, how the state courts work, how there's civil cases and criminal cases, how there's a prosecutor and a defense attorney in a criminal case. And in a civil case, there's opposing counsel. There's usually like a petitioner and the lawyer for the petitioner and maybe a defendant, a lawyer for the defendant. And there's certain steps in this criminal case and steps in the civil case. And you do a little bit of studying and diagramming and figuring out so that you understand how an indictment comes before an arrest and that comes before the arraignment and that comes before the pleas and the motions and that comes before the trial and sometimes the trial without a, a jury called a bench trial and sometimes it's a trial with the jury and and just getting familiar with all of this terminology will help you 
you don't have to become a lawyer or a paralegal, but um, it'll help you put everything in context when you hear it on the test and when you hear it in court. And there are lots of places where you can go to learn that uh, the US legal process, and, and then you start thinking about back in the countries where my language, my other language is spoken, do they have the same system? And if not, what's the closest thing to it that I can use when I'm interpreting out of English? Um, you will practice um, three kinds of interpretation, sight, consecutive, and simultaneous. Sight, um, somebody is unmuted and it's, it's uh, distracting me because I can hear like background noise. I'm just gonna go through and mute everybody. Um, I would love to hear your input, but at, later on, not, not just yet. Um, so uh, site translation means you are given a page, like maybe a, a page uh, with a police report on it describing a crime, and it's in English, and you look at it for a while and think about it, and then you read it aloud in your other language. Um, or you're given a page in the other language, and you look, about it, look at it and think about it, and maybe look at some things up that you don't know, and then you read it aloud as if it were in the other language. So it's going from a written format to a spoken format, which is why it's called site translation. Some people call it sight interpretation. Either one's fine. Um, then the second skill that you practice for the oral test is called consecutive. And this is the one that most people grow up doing socially. Like if you, if your grandma only speaks Spanish and you bring your friends over to meet her and they only speak English and you're interpreting back and forth for your grandma and your friend, that's gonna be consecutive. One person speaks at a time, English, Spanish, Spanish, English, back and forth. And that's usually what we use in a deposition or when a witness is testifying in, to the court. And the lawyer will ask me questions. I'll say them in Spanish for the witness. She'll say it in Spanish to me, and then I'll say it in English back to the lawyer. And that's uh, nice because it's a little bit slower. You have more time to think. There's pauses. But you also have to be ready to take notes really fast because sometimes you ask somebody, they ask, like, describe in your own words how the accident happened. And then they just launch into this long story with all these details. And you're writing like crazy to try to catch up or you're trying to make them pause and let you interpret but then after the pause they get mixed up and they start the story over again but they tell it a different way and so consecutive does have some unique uh, uh, issues that we do in training to get used to them and then finally the third and probably most difficult way to interpret called simultaneous is where somebody like the judges and the judge and the lawyers are just speaking in english back and forth and I'm sitting next to a defendant going into Spanish constantly with no pauses, not taking any notes, just listening and speaking. And so that's challenging because you're multitasking, you're listening and talking at once, you have to talk over yourself, talk loud enough for them to hear you, but not so loud that everyone else hears you. Um, if you have a, a headset and microphone, that solves some of those problems because you can just whisper and then the person listening can turn up the volume. But sometimes we're standing next to the person in front of the judge, and so we have to try to do it uh, without any electronics. Um, there are lots of ways to improve your simultaneous, but basically you just start at real slow speeds, and then you repeat it faster and faster and get comfortable doing it up to a speed of about 120 words a minute, which is um, right now I'm speaking a little bit faster than 120 words a minute. So the test, the people on the test don't speak very fast, but in real life they do. So you have some lawyers that'll talk super fast. And especially if they're reading off a piece of paper, people who are reading always go twice as fast as people who are just talking extemporaneously. So while you are practicing these things and you can get self-study courses or you can take classes to learn these skills, you'll also be recording yourself and then playing it back and grading your own performance and figuring out what you can improve upon. And if you have a study buddy, you'll probably practice with another person and give each other feedback like, um, you did real good until you got to this word here, and then you were confused by this word, and instead of just uh, skipping it and going on, you, you stressed out over it, and then you, you ended up dropping out a whole sentence and things that um, we do when we're stressed out. And when you take the test, of course, you're stressed out. And so the more realistically you can practice, the better you'll do on the test and the better you'll do in the, in the actual courtroom. So it's important to have partners and to study with and to keep you motivated. So this is what the written exam looks like, and these are actual questions from the publication of the NCSC, the organization that creates and uh, updates the exam. Um, it'll say, it'll have some uh, synonyms. A person who feels persecuted in his or her home country may apply for political, 
Anybody want to put it in the in the chat? If you uh, know the answers here, A, B, C, or D, it was done pursuant to the proceedings of the court. Pursuant means in accordance with, in addition to, in conjunction with, or in spite of. And we have a C for the first one, correct. And for the second one, pursuant means A, I agree. Pursuant is a synonym for in accordance with. So it's that level of... Uh, formal vocabulary, stuff that we wouldn't use in everyday conversation unless you're a lawyer, and lawyers love to use formal legalese. The written exam is broken down into these sections. Um, the blue bars show us how many questions there are in that category. There are scenarios, professional conduct questions, things like uh, how you're supposed to behave in court. Sequence is the order that um, steps go in in a trial or in some legal process. Court-related questions will be all kinds of uh, terminology that you would hear in a legal setting. A sentence completion um, is like the examples we just saw. Uh, there's a word missing, choose the most appropriate one that fits in there. And it's always four choices, always multiple choice. And then there are idioms, uh, which are expressions, figures of speech, like in English, we've got, in every language, there's a ton of these, things like a stitch in time saves nine, or uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, just old fashioned cultural expressions that um, you will hear in court and you can't interpret literally because they have a, a cultural meaning that you have to sort of figure out and then explain it or come up with an expression that means something like that in the other language. Uh, antonyms, words that mean the opposite, synonyms, words that mean something similar, synonyms in context, it'll be in the context of a sentence and then sentence completion, you fill in the blank with the best word choice. Um, it is timed by question. No, you have 135 questions and I think uh, three hours to do it. So there's, there's plenty of time. Uh, most people finish a lot quicker than that. Here's another uh, section from the exam. So that was the oral, the written exam. Uh, once you pass the written exam with at least a, I think an 80 in Texas is the, is the minimum, um, then you can go on and take the oral exam. The written exam is entirely in English, so when you're studying for the written exam, don't even bother with the other language. It doesn't matter if you can say it in Spanish or Russian or Chinese. Um, you just want to get your English vocabulary down. Then when you pass the written test, then you can start worrying about the other language and, and practicing your interpreting. This is uh, what one of the scripts looks like on the site translation. Um, you would be given a page. This is just like the top third of the page. Um, but it's an affidavit written by a guy about some crime that he was involved in. And the underlined words are not going to be underlined on the version you're looking at. This is like the answer key. Your version will just all be the same font. And the underlined words show the test grader which words you're being checked on. So you don't have to get every word right, but you don't know which words they're grading you on. So you try to get every word right. And then it, for citizen in Spanish, I would say ciudadano. Um, there may be another word for that, nacional, maybe. Uh, living at, I could say, um, que vivo en, que, uh, que reside en, uh, viviendo en, con residencia en. There's several ways to say living at, um, but it should be at a similar level of formality. Appear, I would want to say number three, not appear like the genie appeared when you rubbed the lamp, aparecer, but rather comparecer is the legal term that means to appear before a judge or to appear before a notary or something. So they're going to be looking, listening carefully to your word choice and saying, is this the best word for this context or is it like just sort of a, um, a false cognate? Are they just grabbing the word that sounds like the English word without um, really understanding um, the way a, you would speak in court? And so you'd go through this, um, do the English into the foreign language and then another page, the foreign language into English, and that would be um, the first mode on your oral exam. Uh, the second mode, um, here, these are kind of out of order. It's fine. I'll do simultaneous next. Uh, simultaneous, you're not looking at this at all. You're just listening to it with headphones, and you're hearing somebody pretending to be a lawyer saying at about this p pace, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for your service as jurors in this case. You will now hear my opening statement. So they're not, not talking very fast, but he is using a lot of uh, key terms that lawyers use, like opening statement, burden of proof, prosecution, and then some terms that aren't really legal terms, but um, they just show that you have a good vocabulary like saloon 
or um, point out uh, bartender. And then if there's dates and times on there, people always mess up on dates and times. And so those are probably going to be, they're going to get take up points off for that. So when I'm interpreting and I hear a number or a date or a time or an age, I always write that down to make sure that I, I don't forget it in the five seconds it takes me to interpret. So you'll be listening to the audio and then speaking into a recorder in this section. Question? Okay. Um, and then the third mode consecutive will be something like this. This is a Spanish version. This is language specific, but I can't show it language neutral. So we're going to look at the Spanish version. Uh, the question will be a lawyer saying, if you would, please state your name on the record. And then there'll be a pause. And then you will say in your other language, if you would, please state your name on the record. And I, in Spanish, I would say, uh, por favor, diga su nombre para que conste en actas, or something like that. There's lots of ways you could express it. And then you'll hear a woman's voice say in Spanish, uh, Leila Coronado. And then you'll repeat, Leila Coronado. And I always try to pronounce it with the, like a real uh, neutral accent, not Leila Coronado, or not as I would authentically say it in Spanish, but because I'm going into English, I'll say the names as if they were English names. That's, that's up to you. Um, then you'll just go back and forth, and in the pause between each speaker, you'll say it in the other language, you'll be recorded, and then they'll send off your recordings and somebody will grade them. So, um, once you, let me go back, once you finish that exam, um, they grade it, they tell you whether you passed or not. A lot of people fail the oral exam, it's hard, you have to really practice. Some people take it just cold, they're like, I'm just going to see how hard it is. And so they take it the first time, they're like, crap, that was really hard. And they go back and study a lot. <laughs> And then um, they take it again later on after they're better prepared. And you can take it repeated, repeatedly. That's, that's fine. It's given in Texas, it's given once every quarter. And you have to come in person to Austin to take it. So there are some expenses involved in paying the fee and travel and lodging if you don't live here in the area. So after you pass and you get your license or your certification in other states, um, then it's a, it's a game of marketing your services. You work. And all kinds of assignments. At first, you take any assignment they give you um, just to get experience and to figure out where you are best suited to interpret. You join associations. There's national and regional associations. You meet colleagues. You meet other interpreters on the job. You make friends. You make business cards and resumes. You get on LinkedIn. I, I created a website, and that was very helpful so that people searching for Spanish interpreter could find me more easily. Um, you figure out what kind of uh, clients you want to interpret for, which ones will pay the best, which ones don't pay at all, and, and you balance, maybe do some pro bono interpreting out of the goodness of your heart, but also figuring out how to pay the bills. And uh, you do, you stand out as an excellent interpreter every time you go, especially the first time to make a good impression, and then people invite you back and they recommend you. And you treat each uh, initial contact as an audition, so it's important to be very polite and cheerful and friendly and to answer emails promptly and to use good spelling and good punctuation and just come across as a professional so that the lawyers, it's mostly lawyers who are booking us or insurance agents or something, so they will consider us to be professionals worthy of the high rates that we charge. So these are some surprises that beginning interpreters sometimes uh, um, report. Uh, half the time, if you are assigned to interpret somewhere, it's canceled. Um, if it's canceled way in advance, then you're out of luck. But if it's canceled within your window, for me, it's a three business day window. Some people say a 24 hour window. Um, then you still get paid. Uh, you have a minimum fee that they're going to pay you. And, and you, you, you uh, explain that in your initial email and they have to agree to it so that there are no surprises uh, if there's a cancellation fee. Um, almost none of your work is in trials. We're hardly ever there standing up in a murder trial, you know, with TV cameras and attorneys shouting at each other and the judge hitting a gavel and all that stuff you see on TV. That, that's really like 1% of what we do. It's almost always in a law office with just a couple of lawyers sitting around or in a jail or, or in, a, in the prosecution office building talking to witnesses before a hearing or, or standing before a judge with one inmate or something like that. Um, lots of uh, little meetings need interpretation rather than full-blown trials. Uh, you spend most of your time just sitting in a courtroom waiting for the, your case to be called. Like there's 30 cases the judge has to go through that day, and you don't know if yours are going to be number one or number 25. And so you sit around on your laptop answering email and reading a book or studying for a test or something. 
until they call you, but you're getting paid for it because you've been booked to be there at 9 a.m. So you get there at 8.45 and you get paid however long it takes. Um, you get paid for cancellations the day before or longer, whatever your policy is. Uh, some judges and attorneys, and I would say a lot of them, really don't understand what we do or how it works, and they need our help to sort of educate them in a very polite and professional way so that they can work with us effectively. Um, there's a huge difference in interpreting uh, different kinds of cases, meaning um, if it's a probate case where somebody died and their kids are fighting over the inheritance versus a juvenile case where a kid was skipping school and smoking pot versus um, a divorce, those are all going to deal with different uh, terminology and different uh, procedures. And so you might be really good in municipal court doing traffic tickets, but then the first time you show up in juvenile court, you're like, holy cow, all these social workers are talking about psychology and I don't know any of this stuff. And so each, uh, each new hearing is a chance to expand your skills. And finally, it's scary for everybody. And anytime you do, you go to a new client, a new court, a new type of hearing, it's scary all over again. And it's sort of like stage fright. It's sort of like karaoke night. You know, you're getting up on stage in front of people and they're watching you and evaluating your performance. And if you are a, a shy and introverted person, that's hard. You have to psych yourself up and uh, visualize success and all those tricks to keep from uh, getting tongue tied. So here's the path. And I, I put a beautiful mountain in the distance there because it's it's a beautiful destination we're headed toward. It's an adventure. Um, as you learn about um, the process, the NCSC is the National Center for State Courts. And I will send anyone this PowerPoint who wants it. Um, they have an excellent website about all the tests and uh, publications with samples and stuff. They're the ones who create the test. And then your state will have a court interpreter webpage that describes the process. Uh, locally, there's the link to the Texas um, site. There are companies that make self-study materials and there are community colleges and universities that have classes where you can build your interpreting skills. It's important to treat it as a, sort of like an athletic competition you're training for, or like uh, you're trying to learn to play the violin, you know. You don't learn to play violin without working with a tutor and going to lessons once a week and practicing every night. Um, otherwise, you'll never become proficient enough that you can perform the violin in public. And so if you have a weekly class and you set aside half an hour every morning and half an hour every evening for practice, then you'll make progress towards that goal. Um, but it takes uh, extended effort. And then finally, YouTube has tons of sample recordings of things happening in court that are very good for practicing your interpretation or just go to the nearest courthouse and find out when they're going to have hearings and sit down in the back of the room with a notebook and write down the words people are saying that you don't know and then look them up. And that's a very realistic way to practice and almost all hearings in the country are open to the public, except for certain hearings involving minors or child abuse, but pretty much any courthouse you walk into, you will be welcome to observe. And if they ask you, are you here for a case? You just say, no, thanks. I'm here to observe. I'm just learning about the process and no one will care. They'll let you stay there. So that concludes my PowerPoint. I'm going to turn off the um, screen share now and look and see if there are any questions yet in the chat. Uh, is the test time by question? Uh, no, 135 questions, three hours. And then the oral test is a lot shorter. It takes about 45 minutes, um, but uh, it, that is timed uh, for each of the three modes. Like, five minutes to do English to Spanish site, five minutes to do Spanish to English site. You have like 30 minutes to do, 25 minutes to do the consecutive and 15 to do the, the simultaneous, something like that. Yes, Blanca, feel free to unmute yourself or to type it there, whichever, whichever you like. Um, hi. hi, sorry, I just, I was sneezing. Uh, I have a question. I signed up to take the reading test in February, and it told me it takes three months to get the results back before I register for the oral test. Why does it take too long? And like, what can I do to move forward and not wait six months yeah. to the next uh, test? Great, great question. They told you three months to get your results? Most people have been telling me the last year it takes them about four weeks. 
I think uh, three months is the worst case scenario. That's like if their staff member gets COVID or something, it might take as long as three months. But you're right, if it does take three months, then that you have a very narrow window to sign up for the oral and they may not have any slots left. So maybe you could um, just sign up for the oral. No, they won't let you sign up until you get your results. I guess um, the only workaround is to go to New Mexico and take it there. <laughs> they, have, they have the same test, but a different calendar. Some people will drive all the way out to Albuquerque and sign up for that one and then transfer their, their, their scores over. But I would, I would say trust that it won't take three months. Trust that they'll have yeah. a better Definitely told me to register for the next one. I need the other ones back. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I was hoping like to take it in June, take one whole week and focus and get those things done. But I said, no, you have to do this first, wait, and then the second test in June when you know when you get the results. So I was just a little bit, I don't know, disappointed. I wanted to get them done. Yeah. To get them. I agree that that is unfortunate, um, but it's hope for the best, you know, maybe, maybe they'll have your grades back in time to take it the following quarter. Question um, from Xin Chao, would you like to go next? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, I have a follow-up question with that. So I passed my written exam in October. Thank you. Yeah. And so I can sign up for the February oral exam, right? <laughs> yes, I was like confused. I didn't really get, you know, I have to wait or something. So I haven't signed up yet. But you can just sign want to up. confirm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my original question is um uh, because I'm already like attorney in Dallas, so being a, like a court interpreter, will this cause like some conflict interest or something? Um, you are not supposed to interpret for your own clients in a case okay. of representing them. But if it's okay. somebody else's client, then you're free to act as an interpreter, whether or not you're also an attorney. Yeah. Is there some kind of like work ethics thing? I mean, I won't, you know, be the interpreter and the attorney for the same client, but I think my motivation to be a court interpreter is probably like build some more clients for my firm. You know, mm. I probably, you know, refer all those cases to my colleagues in the firm or something. So I just don't really know if like, that's like not proper to do that. It's, I, I see a lot of bilingual attorneys interpreting for other attorneys in court when there's no, when there's no interpreter available, that's fine. Oh, um, awesome. That's good to and, know. And some judges, some judges will tell you, oh, is your language Chinese? I'm, I'm, did I see that in the chat? Yeah, yeah, Mandarin, yeah. Okay. So some judges will say, oh, you speak Mandarin and your client does? Well, you can go ahead and just tell me what he's saying. And they will, <laughs> in the interest of expediting the case, if it's if it's off the record or something, you know, just a, a prove up or some simple hearing, they will want you to do it. Um, and uh, we as interpreters are supposed to discourage that, but it's up <laughs> It's up to you and your relationship with that judge, where, how you proceed in that case. But I was thinking in that case, the attorney interpreting won't get paid, right? <laughs> so it's just for, for the judge's like preference. You would not get paid as an interpreter, but if you get paid <laughs> as the attorney, hopefully okay, you're okay. better pay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, second question is like, so after, you know, get certified as interpreter. Is there any like association, you know, can get to know more interpreter to, you know, know or, or do, is there a way to apply to be on the court list? You know, they will call you and just, you know, maybe assign your case, something like that. Yes, I'm putting in the chat here, the two organizations. The first one is a Texas organization and the second one is the national one. These are the okay. professional associations of court interpreters and you can join it now. You don't have to have passed the test. In fact, joining it is a good way to start networking and and plugging into the community. Um, okay. But when you do pass the oral exam, um, then they will put you on a statewide directory that's accessible to judges and court reporters and attorneys and everybody. And you'll you'll get occasionally um, contacted through that state directory. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to find. Like a lot of attorneys don't know where it is, and they will call. <laughs> 
my company and they'll be like, hey, do you guys have a Chinese translator? I'm like, translator or interpreter? And they're like, what's the difference? And I'm like, well, is it speaking or writing? Speaking, okay, Chinese interpreter, uh, we don't, but I, I know where you can find one and I'll send them a link to the, okay. the directory. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, very helpful. Sure, and I'm gonna go back to the chat. Uh, question from Blanca. Do you wanna type it or oh, ask? Somebody asked already asked you about the timing of the tests. Thank you. Okay, and Christina says, can you do freelance translation with a basic license or would you recommend I wait until I get my master license? Um, and I, again, uh, I'm, I'm guessing by translation, you mean interpretation, uh, spoken interpretation, um, and you can do that with no license at all um, or with the basic license just in certain places. Um, the basic license in Texas is if you've gotten between a 60 and a 70 on the oral exam. And a lot of people get between a 60 and 70, they get the basic license, they keep testing, and like the next year they get over a 70 and they get the master license, which is the other tier. Uh, with the basic license, you're supposed to interpret only in a municipal or justice of the peace court that is not a court of record. And that means it'll be a lower level case. Nobody's going to jail. Um, people are being fined for traffic citations and that kind of thing. And there's actually a lot of work in some cities at that level. And it's a good place to get comfortable with the courtroom and to get uh, frequent practice. Um, so I would recommend you use your basic license and do all the interpreting that's available to you um, because it'll just get you that much uh, more prepared for when you have the master license and you're able to go anywhere. Also, um, there are in Texas, the law is kind of complicated about where you need a license uh, and it's different for Spanish versus non-Spanish languages. But uh, technically, if you're in a border county, which is all the southern side of the state or a coastal county, which is from Brownsville all the way up to Louisiana, in any of those counties, you don't need any license for any language. It's like this little known fact is sort of buried in the statutes. And then if you're in a rural county that has under 50,000 people, which is most of the counties in Texas, because we're just ranches and oil fields, um, any of those counties, you don't need any kind of license either for any language. Um, but it's still better to have it. You know, like if, if the judge has the option of going with a licensed interpreter and unlicensed, they'll go with the licensed one, uh, but it's not required. The places where you need the license are in counties over 50,000 that are not border counties. And for for Spanish, um, uh, if there's no, no for non-Spanish, if there's no licensed interpreter within 75 miles, then they can use an unlicensed interpreter. So for Russian and Chinese, um, there are very few interpreters with the credential in the state. I think there's like one for Russian and he's actually in California, so he can't be here in person. Um, and maybe one basic licensee for Russian, one basic and one master. And for Chinese, it's just a couple, it's like three or four um, at the master level. And so a lot of that interpretation is done by people without a license. Uh, next question is from Melissa. Does the National Center for State Courts provide sufficient study materials for the written exam? No, they, they have a, an outline um, that sort of gets you pointed in the right direction, um, but sufficient study materials are gonna come from other sources. I would, I would pretend you're preparing for the GRE or the SAT um, because most of the questions on the written exam are just your, your upper level vocabulary. Um, you study your vocabulary, you know, you can get like flashcard programs or use workbooks to build your vocabulary and across the board, just your high level English. And then you, you learn maybe the top 500 legal words, uh, find a glossary that gives the, the word and the definition There's a ton of free glossaries online. Um, all the common legal terms, uh, specifically for criminal, criminal law, uh, the test doesn't cover civil law. So nothing about divorce or contract disputes or probate or juveniles. Not, juveniles are kind of criminal law, but nothing like that. It's always gonna be a robbery, a mugging, an assault, a murder, that kind of case. Um, so you can find materials like that free online to study for the written test. I also have, a, I can put the, the link in here at the end. I have a self-study free um, program to prepare or at least get you started for the written exam. 
Uh, Christina, another question? Sure. Yes, you are. You are not limited to one question. Go right ahead. <laughs> Vlad has asked me how much does it cost to take the exams? The entire process is currently, I think, about five hundred dollars. If you pass the first time through, it's like a hundred dollars. And correct me if some of you have done this recently. It used to be a hundred dollars for the application and hundred dollars for the written exam and like $300 for the oral exam, something like that. It adds up to about 500. If you have to take it again, then maybe you'll pay another 300 to take the oral exam twice or something. Uh, $200 for the application, $100 for the written, okay. And you also have to take a, a six hour orientation course. Um, I have one for $60. There are others um, that cost between 60 and $200, depending on whose uh, orientation you take. Um, yes, thank you, Melissa. Okay, anybody else? Let me put a link in here for those of you who want to see that my written test prep meeting group chat training. I, yes. I, Go ahead. Um, I was wondering, you know, I think the wrong one. Which is, I, can I do free and for lawyers? Christina, the um, the connection's not real clear. I wasn't able to hear all of that. Um, sort of the call. I no, I think I, I um, asked you. What I want to know was if I'm able to take an employer's based license. Uh, I'm I'm really sorry, but can can you type that in? It, it was just cutting in and out. I don't know if it's at my end or your end. Uh, Marco, how do we take your course? Um, the like the orientation course. Um, that that link I just put in the chat um, also includes the orientation course. It's called the sixty dollar Texas Court Interpretation. See, there I go talking about money again. <laughs> and that's like the cheapest course I find when I'm trying to you know just oh. find a very affordable good course. Yeah. So. When I was when I was in your shoes, I was disappointed with how expensive everything was, and so I decided someday I'm going to come up with cheaper alternatives because I think there's a lot of good people who are kept back by the startup costs and they don't get into the field, and that's that's a shame because you can you can pay for all this stuff in your first day on the job, five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars to get the credential. You can make that in your first day on the job, and so it's it's a small investment if you look at it long term but it's it's hard when you're facing it and it's unknown you're not sure if it's going to pay off or not um christina said oh melissa says is there any interpreting work that we can do while working on certification there's a ton um find a google pro bono legal clinic in your city every city has some pro bono legal clinic and often the people that go in there are immigrants who need help with uh the english speaking attorneys that's a good place to start um christina says i want to know if i'm able to do freelance interpretation for lawyers with a basic license sure you are as long as it's not in court on the record um like if it's in the law firm where they're meeting with their clients that's a great place to use your your uh basic license i passed adriana says i passed the state test and got basic license what should i do next to start working and get experience i'm actually doing a another webinar in one month for you guys um uh, Adriana, if you didn't get that email, um, email me back. I'm going to put my email in here so I can add you to the list. Marco and the um, There, There's a lot that you can do with the basic license, and um, we're going to cover that in, in greater detail. Um, I'll put all kinds of places you can use it. Uh, there are about 3,000 courts in Texas, and probably um, – a third of them, uh, mostly in the big cities, uh, require the uh, the license, the master license, and the rest of them um, don't. And so depending on where you live, there's all kinds of places where you can use it. Christina says she hasn't moved to Texas yet. Okay. If you don't live in Texas yet and you have the basic license, it might be a little bit harder to find uh, remote work, um, but I would uh, get involved in the... Um, What's it called? Soci. There's a, a company called Soci, and it's spelled, I think, with a lowercase o like that. And they have the contract for all of the immigration hearings, and they don't require 
a master license or a basic license, but having the basic license will be a big advantage in getting on their list. And they will um, do probably video conference interpretation like this for people um, seeking asylum and refugee status. And there'll be like a three hour call with a hearing officer and maybe an attorney or a Czech interpreter, a second interpreter and the petitioner and you'll go back and forth interpreting consecutively. And that's a great place to make money and to get experience before you have the master license. Just Google SOSI interpreter jobs and you'll find the site. Anybody else? Do I need a license to do medical Spanish? No, nowhere that I know of do you need any kind of license or certification to do medical, but there is a, a prestigious credential. There are two um, certifications for medical interpreters in the US at the national level, um, and they are uh, the minority of medical interpreters who have earned those get the most work because they're sort of uh, considered to be at the highest level. Um, but most uh, medical interpreting is done by people who just demonstrate that they can do it uh, without any credential. And so probably you'd start small, you'd start like at your local um, free clinic, just to uh, build up a little bit of experience. And then you'd start taking individual jobs from um, small providers, like uh, going for a visit at the doctor's office, and then you work your way up to where you're on call for a hospital and they have you there on a regular basis and it can become a, a higher source of income. A question from iPhone number two. Hi, I'm from Brownsville, Texas. What would be the best place to start? I'm from Brownsville, Texas too. That's cool. Um, the uh, best place to start uh, depends on what uh, what your ability level is right now, what interpreting you've done so far. Um, I need to know a little bit more to give you some suggestions. What does SOSI do? SOSI is just a contractor that won the um, contract from the federal government for all of the immigration hearings. It's, a, it's an agency, um, but they subcontract out the work to thousands of freelancers around the world, mostly around the U.S. So, uh, sorry, yes. uh, the saucy, so it's like you have this sign up or how, you know, you just could get connected with mm -hmm. saucy. I, I haven't worked for them personally, but I, I know people who've had and they, they fill out an online application, send it in probably with their resume and some references, then they get an interview and the interview will be with a, somebody who speaks your language with another interpreter in Chinese, for example, they will chat with you in English and in Chinese, and maybe they'll do a scenario like uh, some role play where they you demonstrate that you can interpret at the level that they need. It's like an in-house test, uh, an application. And if you meet their standards, then they add you to their list. Maybe there's different tiers for different levels of experience. And then they start um, emailing you and they will say, you know, we have a a need for a Mandarin interpreter tomorrow at nine o'clock online central time and they'll send it out to you and several other interpreters in your language and whoever responds first and accepts the job then you're booked and you show up at your own home with your own setup and connect to the call and interpret for them and then submit an invoice and at the end of the month they pay you for all the jobs you've done that month that kind of deal so even uh you know got a base or master certificate you still have to go through their whole application and interview process um, i believe that uh, there will be a, a shorter process if you already have the credential um but i haven't done that myself okay and thank you they they love finding um credentialed interpreters with a license or a certification that, that's what they're hoping for but they don't pay as much as um, be, they don't pay as much because they don't require it. And so it's it's a place where a lot of uh, court interpreters start out and sort of uh, build up their experience and they move on to more lucrative gigs. Um, question from iPhone 2, only at church for my pastors from English to Spanish. Okay, that I did that. I do that too. Uh, I would like to have basic or a study guide to provide this on your YouTube channel. Yes, um, I do have a YouTube channel and I think I email that out to some of you uh, go to YouTube and I don't know the exact channel but just look for text and translation and I've got a bunch of um, videos where you can practice your interpreting uh, is it true that you make more money doing interpreting for civil cases uh, usually um, I for civil cases I can charge 
half day full day rates. So I charge 480 for a half day and 960 for a full day. And the civil lawyers will pay that. Usually the courts, they're like, no, we have a set fee. We're only going to pay you two hours and we're only going to pay you this much per hour. And so I have, and so if I'm free and the, and the court calls me and they're like, we'll pay you $200 to come in and do the hearing and I don't have anything else going on. I'll take it. Sure. And $200 for two hours. That's, that's fine. <laughs> Not bad. Um, but if I, if I have uh, the opportunity to do a half day booking at a deposition instead, then I will try to, that, that's where I focus my marketing efforts. And then the criminal stuff just sort of fills in the cracks. And also uh, court interpreters make more than attorneys sometimes. And I've even had judges ask me how much I make. And I tell them and they, and, and this judge I'm thinking of got mad and he's like, you make more than I do. And I'm a freaking judge. That is so unfair. <laughs> and I told him it's because you get paid by the hour, 40 hours a week. I don't get 40 hours a week. I get two hours here and two hours there and half a day there. And so my, my annual income is probably lower than the judges. All right, we are just about out of time. So I, I'm going to put my email here again one more time. And you're welcome to follow up with questions by email. I, I do these little uh, mini Q&As like twice a year because it's sort of confusing how to get into the process. Um, but if you, uh, between now and then, if you have questions, I welcome you to contact me. And I am, I'm personally invested in getting more good interpreters into the field because I can see that there's more demand than we have to meet it. And there's a lot of people who are being denied justice because they can't communicate with the court. And so I think it's important that people be aware this is an actual job and it's not just uh, an interesting and an important job, but it can be a well-paid job. And I, I want to keep on uh, steering, uh, steering good people into the, onto the path towards court interpreting. So if I can be of assistance to you as you proceed, please let me know. And I appreciate you coming tonight and Merry Christmas, everybody. Have a good holiday. Thank you, Merry Christmas. Thank you, Merry Christmas, everybody. Good night. Thanks for coming.